As a healthcare provider, you may have to deal with the testing and management of tuberculosis, especially if you work in high prevalence settings. As a healthcare worker, you yourself will also be tested for TB every now and then. And regardless of that, I guarantee you that you will be tested for your knowledge of tuberculosis multiple times in your path, since tuberculosis has such a major historical importance and ongoing global impact. There are several aspects of tuberculosis testing and management that are frequently tested for. You can try to memorize them all by brute force, and that's what most people do. But if you're anything like me, random facts don't usually last in memory for more than a couple of weeks, or even minutes. By simplifying some of the concepts, we can iron out most of the confusion and give our memory some longevity. In this video, we are going to talk about latent tuberculosis. After we're done, please tell me what you thought of this approach to help me decide whether I should make one on active tuberculosis too. Let's begin with a quick overview. Latent TB is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, but it's a different concept from active TB infection. It's diagnosed with a skin test or an interferon gamma release assay, and it is treated to prevent progression with drug regimens similar but shorter to those of active TB. First of all, definitions. Latent TB is the presence of mycobacterium tuberculosis without causing active disease. Active tuberculosis is a disease that causes fevers or night sweats, chronic cough or hemoptysis, and weight loss. Due to many known and unknown reasons, some people will be exposed to the bacteria and it will lie dormant for a while without producing any manifestations of disease. It's an asymptomatic infection, so what's the point of treating this asymptomatic condition? Contrary to what a lot of people think, latent TB is not contagious in and of itself, but it does have a well-demonstrated risk of progression to clinical tuberculosis, so that's why we treat it. It's an asymptomatic condition, so we can only pick it up if you actively screen asymptomatic people. The TST is done by injecting a protein derivative of TB in the skin, and then measuring the size of the induration formed 48 to 72 hours later. This will indicate the strength of the immune response to the antigen. You may remember this reaction as one of the examples of a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction from immunology, also known as a delayed cell-based response. And the IGRA is a blood test that consists of exposing the subject's blood to some specific TB antigens and seeing how much interferon gamma was released by the T cells after that. And this is also a measure of a cell-based response by our T cells, rather than a humoral antibody response by our B cells. Antibodies are just not the main way that the body fights off mycobacteria. If someone tests positive on these tests, does it immediately mean that they have latent TB? No, it doesn't. The most important thing to remember is that you have to rule out active TB first. The people that are undergoing testing are generally doing so because they were thought to have some risk of exposure to TB, and they usually haven't been evaluated by a clinician before the testing was done. So if someone tests positive, you should call them back in for a clinical evaluation to rule out any signs and symptoms of active disease. They should also obtain chest x-rays, as active TB may be asymptomatic and they immunocompromised. If there are any suspicious signs or symptoms, you should also collect sputum samples for bacteriological testing to confirm the diagnosis. We're not going to dive too deep into the diagnosis of active TB right now, but you should know that either a positive sputum study or a convincing clinical picture can establish a diagnosis of TB. If active disease has been ruled out and a person has positive immunologic tests, it's determined that they have latent TB. And the next question that should be in your head is, does everyone who have latent TB need treatment? And the only way to answer that is to compare the risks and benefits of treatment versus no treatment. With no treatment, how bad the risk of progression actually is, versus the side effects from the treatment, the costs, and how much the treatment actually lowers the risk of progression. The most important study on this was this one. It was the first randomized controlled trial of treatment of latent TB. So it studied active treatment with different durations of isoniazid versus a control group taking placebo. The population studied were people with latent TB and evidence of a prior TB infection. They limited the study to this group rather than anyone with latent TB because they were expected to have a higher risk of recurrence and so be more likely to benefit from treatment. After starting the treatment, they followed the patients for 5 years, and in the placebo arm, around 1% of the patients developed active TB. With treatment, that number was brought down by 75%, with a number needed to treat of around 90. You're certainly thinking that this was not a super impressive number, but as I said, it's a matter of risks and benefits. 
because the only significant adverse effect was hepatitis, with an incidence of 0.5% over the five years studied, with a number needed to harm around 200. So the main conclusion was that by using isoniazid, you prevent tuberculosis at double the rate that you cause hepatitis. A quick side note that must be brought up is that isoniazid can cause vitamin B6 deficiency and cause peripheral neuropathy, but this risk is mitigated by supplementing the patients who have other risk factors for neuropathy, such as diabetes. Since this trial, further studies have been published and the incidence of significant hepatitis was found to be lower, down to about 1 in 1,000. And also, other studies have found incidences of progression to active TB to be in the range of 1 to 3% in some high-risk groups. So it further tilts the balance towards the benefits of latent TB treatment. And also, other regimens of treatment were tried out and showed very good results, with the advantage of shorter durations of treatment and even better side effect profiles. So now we have the options of using isoniazid alone, rifamycin-based agents alone, or a combination of the two. Any of these options are acceptable, and the choice of regimen will usually come down to availability of resources and prescriber and patient preference. And the last question is, who should be getting tested? A well-known guideline for that is that the decision to test is a decision to treat, which means that people who have low risks of progressing to active TB or who are unlikely to actually have been exposed to TB shouldn't even be tested at all. For latent TB testing, there is a chance of false positives and of false negatives, just as with everything else in life. False positives here can happen due to patient exposure to other types of mycobacteria, which can well be entirely non-pathogenic, such as the one which is actually used as a vaccine for TB, the BCG. This is a problem with TST more specifically, and IgRA is a more sophisticated test and avoids these false positives, but it's not always available or feasible. Confirmed exposures is the first category to be tested. This includes household contacts of people diagnosed with tuberculosis and people who have had close contact with tuberculosis patients. The definition of this is not clear-cut, but something like being within 6 feet for around 15 minutes is a general guideline. Healthcare workers in general, and people who reside in congregate settings such as prisons and homeless shelters, as well as people migrating from high-incidence countries, are also considered to be people who were potentially exposed. Other than exposure, we should also test people who would be at higher risk of disease activation, so people with immunosuppression, such as those undergoing cancer treatments, or with immunodeficiencies, especially HIV. Young children have also been found to be at particular risk of invasive disease, as is demonstrated by this chart. So, alright, the testing protocol is at last. You probably opened this video because you wanted to clear up the confusion about all these terms here. So let's go ahead and start. These names here are all different ways to say TST. These are all varieties or synonyms for IGRA. And these apply to how you interpret the TST. A general guideline for testing would be this. For people who are in the categories I mentioned, screen once with whichever test is available. Whenever there are new exposures, be it in the risk groups or not, you also screen with one test. There is no need for annual or any routine surveillance. And there is also no need for routinely testing children, even though they do fall into one of the high-risk categories. If someone tests positive, rule out active TB, as we outlined before, and then go ahead with latent TB treatment. The choice of which test to use is not a standardized answer, and I don't think it will ever be. There has never been any head-to-head -head trial comparing different testing strategies for each scenario, and given that such trials would need very long follow-ups and would have low expected differences in outcomes, it's unlikely that there will ever be one. Other than just using a one-off test, as we've said, you can choose to mix these ingredients in any number of ways to tune up the sensitivity and specificity according to what you need. So you basically apply that general rule. If you test in series, you increase your specificity. If you test in parallel, you increase your sensitivity. If you're not entirely familiar with these concepts, pause the video and take some time to let them sink in. An extreme version of trying to increase your sensitivity is the WHO recommendation that in resource-constrained settings, you can actually forego any testing and offer treatment for latent TB according to exposure only, effectively ruling everyone in. On the other hand, in high-resource settings and for lower-risk people, such as healthcare workers in general, you can test people in series. So you would start with a TST, 
and either rule it out if it's negative or if it's positive, you use an IGRA, which is more specific, to confirm the positivity. And to increase the sensitivity of your testing, especially in high-risk populations, you can test in parallel and you can use the booster strategy with the TST. This means that in the case of a negative result, you can place a new TST in one of four weeks and see if it refreshes the memory of your T-cells. And of course, the first thought that comes to mind is whether the booster testing in itself wouldn't cause a false positive. It is said that it doesn't, that in the absence of mycobacterial infection, the booster phenomenon simply won't happen because there is no established immunity to boost. But I couldn't actually find any empirical data to back that up, so if you do, please let me know in the comments. And also regarding TST, there's the matter of whether to consider 5 mm, 10 or 15 as the cutoff for a positive reaction. In the past, this was used as a way to tune the test performance parameters according to different pre-test risk levels. So if you're more lax about whether you consider an induration a positive test, you're casting a wider net, so you'll gain sensitivity but lose specificity. But now with the increased availability of IGRA as a confirmatory test, this approach is kind of falling out of favor. As you can see, there are plenty different strategies to memorize if you want. The best we can do is to learn the basic principles and when it's time to apply them in clinical practice, just follow whatever one your institution chose to use. Alright, I think that is all you need to know about latent TB. I hope this video helped clear up some of the complexity involved. I know it's a lot. So let's try to sum it up. Latent TB is not contagious, but it has a risk of progressing to active TB and then becoming contagious. We test those with known or assumed exposures or with conditions that put them at high risk of progression. We can use TSTs, IGRAs, or a combination of the two, depending on the risk profile and the availability of resources. After a positive test, a patient should be first ruled out for active disease. Patients with positive skin or IGRA tests but no active TB should be treated with a regimen of either rifamycin-based agents, isoniazid, or a combination of the two, again, depending on resource availability. The aim of all this is to, at some point, eradicate tuberculosis from the world, just like we did with smallpox and are coming close to doing with polio. I hope you enjoyed watching this video, so if you did, click the thumbs up button below. If you didn't, go ahead and click the thumbs down because all feedback is welcome. The next video I'm gonna make is gonna be about mechanical ventilation, so stay tuned to learn more about mysterious and intriguing subjects that you wish were made more clear.